Hey, this is Perch. I'm here with Joe and Nancy Collins. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for coming for, yeah. to talk to us. I, I uh, for those of you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows Nancy Collins. I think uh, is certainly responsible for one of the most memorable Swamp Thing runs that uh, we we've, we've had on that title. Um, Joe and I are talking right before we went on the air that uh, you you had the second longest run on the book, uh, technically. Yeah, technically uninterrupted. 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 Yeah. yeah. Rick. Rick was. If Rick had been allowed to finish, you know, he and I would probably have been neck and neck. Maybe. Maybe he might have even gotten another year out of it. Who knows? Um, uh, nowadays, where they just kind of keep you down to a year, year and a half contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably never going to see that again, unless you know. It doesn't. You know, it, it feels like if you're successful, they're going to want to move you to another book. And if you're not successful, or, then they won't renew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's usually how it goes. I was offered Animal Man oh, at really? the end of my run, and I just really didn't want to do Animal Man. <laughs> 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 so, like, I, uh, I had a choice of either doing Animal Man or my own creator own thing, and I went with the creator own thing, which ended up just not working out. So. Yeah. How, how, did you, uh, how did they find you? How did, um, how did you get offered the gig? Well, that's an interesting story <laughs> because um, one, uh, it has a lot to do with Stuart Moore mm -hmm. um, and New Line, uh, New Line Films. Okay. Um, for some reason, New Line, I they there were there was an executive at uh, New Line called uh, named Dave Imhoff who liked my work. Uh, my first novel, Sunglasses After Dark, was doing real well. It, I was getting all kinds of awards and everything. And for some reason, I guess Dave read it to, because well, his job was uh, licensing and merch and picking up properties for New Line. And he retired shortly after he picked up Lord of the Rings. Ah, okay. <laughs> so that's the last time I saw Dave. But, mm -hmm. but he was he was involved in stuff with like Te Texas Chainsaw Massacre, especially the Freddy Krueger franchise. Um, uh, a few other things, but um, the, at that time they were doing um, some Freddy Krueger related and prose anthologies mm -hmm. at St. Martin's Press. And Dave decided that he liked my work and he wanted me to, he wanted the editor to approach me about writing something for uh, this anthology called Freddy Krueger's Seven Sweetest Dreams of like little novelettes or novellas. Nice. Uh, and uh, originals. And and that was Stuart. And Stuart contacted me and, and arranged for me. And I, I ended up writing uh, this, little, this novel I called Not Just a Job, which which had the benefit of like having almost no Freddy Krueger in it. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like one of the Freddy Nightmares episodes as opposed to like, yeah. yeah. And so it had very little Freddy Krueger in it. So... I was actually able to just actually write a you know a serial killer story without having much of him involved, right. and um, and Stuart really liked working with me because I was like well I was mine was like the only story that didn't involve a lot of rewrites. Very nice. And, <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. And then shortly after that, he jumped ship and went to DC Comics, and um. DC at that time that was during the D Doug Wheeler run, mm -hmm. yes, and where literally the sales, but but well by today's standards the sales wouldn't be bad, right, right. Yeah. But you got to remember this was like ninety, you know, nineteen ninety. If you drop below forty thousand a month, um, right, you were on the bubble, and if you drop down below thirty, you got the axe and. Swamp Thing was actually below 30. And the only reason that they hadn't canceled it at that time is because there was also a TV show going on. Yeah, yeah. The, the USA TV show, which I've never seen. I think I've seen a episode of it. Mm -hmm. And the cartoon show, yeah. which I think I've seen the opening of, and a toy line. And that's the only reason that Swamp Thing stayed, was staying alive is because of those... Uh, merchandise, <laughs> merch merch yeah, merchandising streams, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, 
they they what they wanted is they wanted to find someone who was not necessarily a comics writer, but someone with a background in horror. Yeah. And if they had a background in comics too, that was fine. But they wanted something a little, you know, a bit try to bring Swamp Thing back to quote unquote his roots in horror. And yeah. um and I was one of like five or six horror writers who was approached at the time. And um because Stuart knew me, and he, and he oh yeah, I, I, I get good old Nancy, and um, and at the time I was living in New Orleans, and had been for almost a decade. So um, uh, he said, "Well, do you, th- do you do you know anything about Swamp Thing?" Oh, oh God, yes! I'm ever since the front, I, ever since you know, Lynn and Bernie were created it, and and especially the the Alan Moore and Beset runs and Veach, yeah. you know, the Veach runs are all yeah. major things for me. And he said, well, do you think you can do, you know, give us a, you know, out, outline a proposal for the first, for the annual of the first 12 issues? And I went, okay, how, you know, did, tell me how I'm supposed to do that. What it's <laughs> supposed to look like. So he told me, you know, just a little thumbnail things, but a little bit more detail on the annual. And that's, um, well, and it's and, and it's why I relied on my background actually living in the Louisiana area, New Orleans, and having grown up in Bayou Country. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, Bayou Bartholomew, which is like one of the largest, the it's actually the largest and longest Bayou system in the world. Ended, you know, it, it finally came to its end about like maybe fifteen twenty miles from my house. Yeah. So it went right past us. It went right past my grandparents' house, and well, so I grew up with you know Bayou Bartholomew and and everything that involves living in Bayou Country. So I just put a lot of that into the pitch and the and the outline, and uh, they went with it. And I don't even think it, it dawned on them that they were hiring a woman <laughs> yeah. at the time. That there were a couple other women who were you know that were. Um, when they launched Vertigo, they realized they had two other women mm-hmm. uh, writing books for them, and so that was kind of like the angle. But that was yeah. before it became a big deal. Well, I mean, you um, know, one of the first uh, women writers in at in, DC, at DC, yeah. Yeah. the 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 only. There were women who were writing at DC beforehand, but didn't have runs. Like Mindy Newell right. was writing yeah. stuff, but. Uh, Louise they didn't give them one shot or two shots, you know. Yeah. But the, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, Wheezy was the first woman I think who got a run on Man of Steel, but only started a month before you Swamp Thing run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah, I was one, of, but no one really made a big fuss about that at yeah. the time. Um, I, I do have to when I do interviews, I do part point out that that I am the first and to date only woman to have written Swamp Thing. Yeah. Um, which is interesting since my run ended over 25 years ago. <laughs> so, um, and I am the first woman to have written Vampirella. Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah. And not the only one now. They've, they've managed to uh, do a better job on the batting on that one. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, and to my knowledge, I'm the only woman to have written uh, Army of Darkness. Yeah. I, I think okay. that's true, yeah. Yeah. So... No. It, it it is funny. They, you're right. They they didn't make a big deal out of it at the time. And what's odd is they don't they don't really recognize that part of their history today. Like you'd think this would be something DC would really want to tout or any of these comics. Well, it's comics. like the 1990s, did, except for Sandman and yeah. Lucifer. The 1990s didn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, like like they they you know you know scrub my continuity off the face of the earth. Well, yeah. They, to scrub it and then bring it back and then scrub it again and then and scrub it again and scrub it again yeah. and it, it, I don't it, Tefe doesn't exist anymore, does she? Well, I don't um, think so. It's unclear. Like in the in the re- most recent event, they said everything now matters and everything is still around, but who knows what that means? Well, they yeah. bought they bought they ended up buying my pitch for the uh, for a Tefe based miniseries when they bought the. When mm-hmm. when you know when we did the uh, the omnibus, you know they basically bought my pitch from me. Yeah, well, and so he <laughs> might that might emerge at some point or another where I have her being a witch queen. So 
There you go. Yeah, I I hope so. But uh, but yeah, it is interesting because um, a lot of the other women, like Rachel Pollack, um, none of her stuff has been collected. Rachel was transgender too. That yeah. was uh, even by, uh, even before. Uh, well, any the, of the that uh, um, you know focus on now now that there's a focus, there's there's no attention to what was done in the '90s. It's, yeah. it's odd. Now, you know? now, now we, it, the, yeah, I'm I'm a late I'm technically a boomer, but I'm in that bizarre kind of like baggy crotch between <laughs> you know the baby boomers and gen x where we yeah. you know they, they call us generation jones because our yeah. <laughs> our our formative era is was not you know the 1960s i was alive during the 1960s but my formative teen years were shaped more by punk than uh yeah. the summer of love and and getting out of high school and college when with a failed economy yeah yeah so we um it's a different you know kind of a different era and i kind of we i'm you know we kind of get all ignored it's like who's the boomers you know the boomers yeah. boomers boomers that are you know the ones from the 40s up until the mid 50s and and what i what when i was growing up what i called the big kids yeah <laughs> and <laughs> Yep. And we get, and by by, by 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 end of the stick, oh, we always got all the stuff that the big kids used to play with. But after all the new had been rubbed off of it, <laughs> yeah, that's and, good for some comics there. <laughs> yeah, so that's a that's that's uh, I like to think of that. I mean, basically, the like the like the only people from my from my flight, I guess you could call it from at that time, especially launching. Yeah, you know, I was one of the people launched Vertigo. Yeah. Um, yeah, only one's only man standing's Neil. Yeah, yeah, that's also very strange. They've it's it's odd to me. They've done revivals or they've attempted to revive Vertigo, and the uh, the obvious answer of like, hey, maybe we should go back to the original uh, creators that we had there and see if they want to do something. Seems like that would be a decent idea. I don't know. Well, everybody I worked with, either dead or retired. Yeah, fair enough. In yeah. editorial, and and back then you still had editors who had gone up through the ranks and who had a right and had. Or had been artists themselves. Now it's all marketing people. So I don't know. You know yeah, it's is... a very different culture. For yeah, sure. you know. And uh, he, another person like Caitlin R. Kiernan had that dreaming run, and that's not really collected. They there's like a couple of trades, but that was a whole long run she had. And they have a Sandman TV show. You'd think you'd want to collect that and get that out the door. Yeah. Strange yeah. You know, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, well, Caitlin's another transgender. Yeah, yeah. That was, you know, a lot of diversity, not a lot of, well, they had, well, they had the Millennium imprint at that time. So, you know, Vertigo would t yeah. did tend to be rather, rather white yeah. <laughs> in terms of the creators. Yes. Um, uh, but they did have the, you um, know, Millennium imprint with, you know, with all mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, African American and Hispanic creators over there, and, yeah. and Static is apparently still around in some way, they're shape, trying. or form. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're trying to. Uh, I, I think you know they keep saying that Milestone's going to come back every year. It's Milestone. Yeah, yeah not Milestone. I, 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 I do what you. I do what you. Do. Millennium, yeah. what, Millennium yeah. was their science fiction imprint, which the only thing that came out of that was uh, Transmetropolitan, I think. They moved that to Vertigo, yeah. And they moved that to Vertigo, yeah. Melinda was originally going to be called Matrix, but oh. then they, but then uh, Time Warner said, "No, you can't do that. We got this movie coming out." <laughs> so. It's it's all very it's it is very peculiar because there are a lot of really um, really uh, different things being done, really powerful things. But but reading through this your run again, um, it it holds up. It doesn't feel dated at all. Um, it, it would be, if you took it off the shelf today and, and read it, it would, it reads like a nice contemporary horror. Yeah. yeah I'm sorry for, for coining the term, make America great again. <laughs> I, I did That's notice true. that. And the guy calling the Baron was wearing a red cap. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, Ben Baron was at the time a parody of David Duke, who is still with us, unfortunately. Yep. But yeah. at that time was running for the governor of New of uh, Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. And I accidentally called that. Yeah. That's one thing. And so <laughs> I ended up doing a lot of like political radio shows. And back then they didn't call you. You had to go into the radio station. Yeah. Right. And they would be, I'd be just sitting there 
And all these people going, so how'd you guess that? How did you, how could you <laughs> possibly guess that David Duke would be running for the, you know, as the, G, uh, the GOP candidate for, uh, for the, you know, okay, the Louisiana there. governor. And I was, well, I just thought, what would be the stupidest thing people could do? <laughs> where all the great ideas start. Yeah, the stupidest thing you could do is run a Klansman for governor. Yes. And they just didn't want to hear that. They wanted to think I had some like insight. No, what's the stupidest thing you could do? And it's pretty much holding true today. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's the basic. Never <laughs> underestimate the the power of stupidity. <laughs> it, it, it sells well every time. Yeah. It's immovable. It's it it, it in gravity. And uh, uh, taxes and death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> always, always bet on dumb. It, it is. Good thing. Same thing. You, uh, I thought you mentioned at the, the beginning, but one of the the most powerful things about your run that I I don't see in a lot of other books is it is very. You mentioned the location where you grew up, wanting to infuse mm -hmm. this into the comic. And more than I see almost any other book, it really feels like the location, like the 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 environment is a character in the book, yeah. Uh, in, throughout your whole run, and it's I I was really impressed how you pulled that off. I mean, it, it's right from the very first issue, you really feel immersed in this this land. Yeah. Well, uh, some of that has to do with being a novelist. I think being a novelist yeah. first is. I mean, th th there is different uh, uh, the disciplines of comic scripting and playwriting and being a playwright and, and being a novelist or uh, they're r related disciplines, but they are somewhat different mm. and not, and not necessarily, you know, not everyone who's a screenwriter can be a good novelist. Not everyone who's a novelist, good novelist can be a good screenwriter. And, and, and there's no guarantee they can write a comic book worth hell. And, um, sure. But I grew up, it, it, but it also helps that if you grew up with the medium, and I grew up reading comics. I think the first one, uh, I, was, I was like three, three or four when I started reading comics. And there was things like Herbie. Yeah. You know, some, back when they used to write create comics for children, you know. <laughs> the, uh, little Lulu, Herbie, um, yeah. the, the Harvey titles, like Little Lava, Hot Stuff, um, yeah. Wendy, Casper, um, uh, of course, the Walt Disney stuff, and then I kind of the first non um, kids book that I can remember reading was uh, Jack Kirby, uh, Fantastic Four. Yeah, and, and, I, and I these were all hand me downs from my older cousins, and you know, so you know, and um, I remember reading that, and I remember. Um, Getting a lot of Lois Lane and and Jimmy Olsen comics, which even as a child I was going, this is weird. <laughs> this, is like, you know, this is why, why you know, it's like, oh, don't tell me it's another dream. Yeah. <laughs> a, Superman isn't were, really married to a mermaid. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, comics for bananas always. Uh. Oh yeah, that was all uh, Mort White Singer too. I think his whole yeah. thing was uh, he'd he'd ask kids on the street. And uh, they would say, like, oh, I'd like to read, like, a Jimmy Olsen comic or something. So I was like, all right, we'll do that. <laughs> well, I was like, well, I did like, all, you know, I did like all the gorilla comics. I like mm -hmm. those. Yeah. <laughs> so they're putting gorillas in. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, but, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of weird stuff. And then there was, like, kind of like the, you know, like the Jerry Lewis comics that DC put out. And, oh, yeah. You mm -hmm. know, it kind of, you know, gag comics and, of course, Archie and uh, things like that. And... And I, I just, I, I just grew up in it, yeah. and uh, as just a casual reader. And I didn't really start getting into comics until I was like twelve or thirteen. Okay, yeah. Which I think is, you know, that's when you either develop a real serious interest in it, or you just go off. And nowadays, I guess it's that's probably not the case because comics start, yeah. have been replaced by video games. Yeah. Yeah. That used to be the arc. I mean, I would see it, and and one of the reasons why your run is very fond to me is, um, uh, I, I you're going to make me feel old now. No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I started my store uh, when your run was out, so I was selling your mm -hmm. comic, 
and it was uh, it, you know people were coming in and reading the comic, and and it was a it was I, I remember a lot of people coming in being very excited that the the run had changed, and and ah. you know not to knock the previous run, but it, it well, there was a sense of this is a there's long. a reason why I was brought on. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. In the nicest way possible. Yeah. But people, I, I remember it was one of those books where from the very first issue of the creative team, people are coming in going, um, this is what I was wanting. This is back to, you know, it, it was, this is, if you could just cut everything out between Alan Moore and Nancy Collins, then, and, which isn't fair, but that was. Yeah, because I, I considered Rick's work to be very. Um, oh, I did too, yeah. yeah. Very important. I, I think so. Uh, and you build on a lot of it, but it yeah. was. Yeah. But I remember one of the the parts um, that was said was just that the the environment was so refreshing to people because a lot of the other superhero comics were they were in faceless city number two and it was like whether yeah. it was Metropolis or New York or Gotham even then it was all kind of just city Star and, City yeah. whatever yeah, yeah. well I, I made the I made the point of making Swamp Thing a a family man yeah yeah yes and uh, basing it on family because that's that's basically core of southern culture is your family and where you are and how you're dealing with where you are and um uh, i've been living in new orleans uh for pretty much a decade by that point and i i knew people who were cajuns i knew people you know i'd grown up in that that whole that whole milieu so i just wanted to you know give a little bit of what i you know flavor to it, and I, something goes to Mardi Gras. Something runs for the governor of Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a very cool story, but I mean that yeah. that little bit. I mean, it was um, it, it managed to be political satire without being tired political satire. It was it was yeah. uh, it fit the theme. It, it still had a horror. Well, we got to understand uh, the term "all the president, all the president's men" mm -hmm. comes from all the, all the king's men, which comes from the story of. Uh, uh, Hugh P. Long. Yeah. He was the governor of uh, Louisiana and was Trump before Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got himself yep. shot for it, too. But, yeah. Um, you know, just postponed the inevitable, I guess. But, um, but yeah, he was he was very close to a fascist. He would have been a fascist dictator along yeah. with, yeah, you know, at that time, just identical to um, Hitler and Mussolini coming up, probably closer to Mussolini. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but he got himself assassinated for his trouble. So, um, so that that utilizing uh, and and politics in Louisiana is just so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, Banana Republic is is you know a polite it, way of putting it. I mean, very different feel from other parts of the country. For sure. Yeah. Well, basically to live in, and to live in New Orleans, you have to put up with living in Louisiana. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the price you pay <laughs> for living in New Orleans. <laughs> kind of like Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta, the yeah. price you pay is living in Georgia. It's uh, it, yeah, uh, <laughs> for sure. I'm up here in the Seattle area. I'm sure people on the East part of the state uh, have, very strong feelings about it. <laughs> oh yeah, I've been to Seattle. I've spent time in Seattle on, on the Pacific. I came real close to moving to Portland oh, in the okay. early nineties and it was just too far a drive. My grandmother wasn't, um, was a little too elderly and was getting it, starting to get elderly and I just didn't want to be that far away from her yeah. in case something happened. So I, I, I made a few attempts to move out to the West coast and then something would happen with grandma and my mother and I would just, uh, Rather yeah. be closer on the east coast and yeah. so well, if you enjoy uh sunlight then this isn't the place to be anyway so. oh yeah yeah it's, <laughs> not, it's not good for people with seasonal disaffection yeah no. that's for sure yeah. if you like your sunsets at three o'clock in the afternoon in the winter yeah time, yeah, yeah. well my dad lived in alaska for a while okay. uh when before long before i was born and he was going yeah yeah the sun came up and kind of hung there for three weeks <laughs> 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 Looked like it might continue to come up, but never did. Yep. <laughs> That's when I That's... decided I needed to move home. <laughs> so it's, it's that it's and the bear shot. getting in the tent. A lot of people move up into the ferry in the summer, and it's beautiful. And then they then they pay for it. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I like said mosquito mosquitoes the size of your hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and that and the bear. He actually did have a bear get inside his tent. 
So oh, that's uh, going to wake you up nicely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. You know, Joe, when, when we first, uh, when I first, uh, Joe told me we'd, we'd be able to talk to you and everything else, we, we both started reading this run. And Joe, you you commented right out the gate, you know, this very first issue, like you, you get to serious stuff immediately. Like yeah. it's, there's no there's no waiting on this comic to, to let you know that you're in for a very different experience. Do you? you... Well, that was the milieu at the time. Uh, it, Vertigo was rising. Yeah. I mean, Sandman had been on, had been going for about a year or so now at that time and there was that the creator you know we're remaking comics we're turning it into something besides crap you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're we're remaking it for for our you know, for for a new generation we're making it making them stories and like like legitimate storytelling and that yeah. was you know, something besides guy you know panties and capes yeah. you know just so that that fe- there not ever not all of us felt that way, but there was a core of us: me, Neil, uh, Pete Milligan, mm-hmm. um, uh, Garth. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was in that group. Um, well, probably Grant Morrison would be in. Grant, that group. yeah, Grant. Uh, um, um, it's interesting uh, because. Rachel, yeah. The '90s um, managed to pull off this uh, this rise of this more art. I don't know if that's the right term, but just this this other way of storytelling. While simultaneously, you had the very over the top spandex era, also you know taking. Oh off. yeah, the, the 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 grimacing hemorrhoid. Yeah. You know, superhero, <laughs> nothing but teeth from here to here, and. Yeah. and <laughs> And but it was great for for customers because <laughs> Bandolier, bandoliers and shoulder packs, tons so, of pockets. Yeah, yes. the pocket, the pockets. Yes, you could come in though and get whatever you wanted in a con. There's a period of time where whatever, whichever kind of story you wanted, it was in that is in the shop. And it was. We were we were that was comic storytelling was starting to become European, I would think, uh, you know, and not, not necessarily Japanese. I mean, the influence no. of manga and anime is very much in there, and it's much more now. At that time, we were all being, you know, this was a generation that was heavily influenced by Metal Hulk. Yeah. And um, uh, people like Mobius and... Oh, yeah. Um, so we were all finally getting, coming into our own and, and basically utilizing our, our, our influences in telling stories. And, um, you know, all, all of us, all of us were laboring in the shadow of Alan Moore. Yeah. 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 So, um, much more so than we were Stan Lee or anybody else. Um, uh, I guess Frank and Frank and Alan are the two, uh, shaping influences, uh, uh, the the left and the right hand that mm-hmm. shaped the pottery that became 1990s comics yeah. in America. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. It was, uh, I mean, a lot of people think about when, when you talk about the nineties today, a lot of people remember the image revolution and kind of the X-Men selling millions of copies and these types of things, but oh, just, all the stuff that led to the collapse of the yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. market. <laughs> It's funny. Yeah. Really, I, I I have this uh, this mixture of happiness and bitterness because, of course, running a store during that time period was not a treat, uh, as you can imagine. Um, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> um, on either end, it wasn't it wasn't fun while things were going up either because you were under ordering and stuff was late and it was it was chaos. But in many ways, at least for me and, and my shop, and I don't think this was true of everybody, but uh, the bedrock for a lot of the the sales was the Vertigo books were the ones that were very consistent. They would come out yeah. and had an established fan base. People would buy it. While everything else was wildly swinging around, these books were kind of pulling their weight. Well, Vertigo is uh, uh, the best exa- example of, of the kind of comics where you could go, look, look, this it's not all crap. Here, look, yeah. you, know, this, <laughs> you can read this. You're, you're a grown-up. A grown-up could read this. Watchmen was very much influential in that regard. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because that was, you know, that one actually made the New York Times bestseller list when it went graphic novel. And some of the Sandman stories, too, once they started mm-hmm. collecting them. Yeah. And um, so they, it gave a certain amount of uh, uh, authenticity and and it maturity, to, you know, 
it's not, it's not that maturity wasn't just the you know big boobs and swearing you could do <laughs> you can have complicated con- concepts of complicated characters and 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 back but back then still that's the biggest the biggest deal with my when I look back at my run is you could tell no one was and especially most of those from that time no one was writing for the trades right yeah you know basically you, you were told you know you can have two or three you know a two or three issue story arc, but none of this, you know, 12, 15, 20 issue story arcs that, that you have now. Um, Yeah. And that was your run. You were doing a lot of the comics were kind of, I almost, the one and done is wrong. I think to say, because you were putting plots that you were then carrying forward issue to issue, like the conflict would be usually often not in the beginning, sometimes resolved in one issue, maybe two. I had, I had, I had uh, subplots. Yeah, and you, you were, yeah, <laughs> exactly, which uh, for some reason is a dirty word today. I'm not sure why, uh, because I don't know whether it's you or Claremont or others. It's, subplots tend to carry a title. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, all 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 functional narrative has subplots. <laughs> yes, uh, I, agree. <laughs> I mean that's that. I was I was just doing whatever you know everyone else does. You know, put. You can't have just a story that's all plot is boring as hell. Yeah. Yeah. And it also doesn't allow you to have character development. And that's the other thing. I think the biggest thing with image at the time, I would just look at it and it goes, there's no character development. Right. There's no subplots either. You know, it's just, it's just, you wanted to see what all plot looks like. 1990s life held. Yeah. No subplot, no sub, sub, and no subtext, nothing. Well, and and, it, it, it helped and it's not, and it's not really rewarding to at least for for writers because I read, I may read comics for a different reason than people who are into art read them. Yeah. Well, no, I mean it, it. It helped, I guess, then because they they could then uh, be late on shipping a comic for six months, and it didn't really matter because you you didn't have any subplot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it didn't matter. You know, there was no story arc. Yeah. It's not like 1963 where we'll never know what the hell happened. <laughs> it's like, that was the only the only image comic that I that I really liked and followed was 1963, which was the yeah. only one with the damn plot. <laughs> it is, so, it, it's so weird in 2021 that it, uh, we're missing the subplot. <laughs> That's so weird, but it's true. It's it's. Um, it, that you do notice this when you read this run. Um, I think that was a comment that Joe made to me. Was that you know, hey, this thing actually has some depth to it. This is this has it's a yeah. there's a lot of things going on right out the first issue. Yeah. Uh, well, basically, um, I just wrote it like a kind of like a southern gothic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, the people go, oh, it's a horror. Well, no, it's a, I utilized a lot of southern gothic elements in Swamp Thing, at least in the first year. And then the second year, it started getting more into like fantasy, a little bit more fantastical. But but yeah. most of the stuff that's happening in the first year is stuff that could more or less just you know is stuff I was taking out of the newspapers and yeah. just giving a little bit of giving a little bit swamp thing spin to, and um, that was and, and I had fun doing it. You know, but basically I was more or less left left alone to do what I was doing. We had a couple of hiccups along the line art wise. Um, yeah, there was a few changes. Yeah. Um, our original artist had a, a, um, a Bill Joska mm-hmm. uh, had a, a nervous breakdown while drawing uh, the annual. We were not aware of that at the time until when he was supposed to be the monthly artist as well. And he got in, he got, all we ever got was three pages of issue, the first monthly issue out of him. Oh, mm. okay. And that's when we found out, you know, he wasn't responding to faxes or phone calls or anything like that. And we found out he'd had a nervous breakdown. And um, and we had to, they had to scramble to find someone to take it. And luckily Tom Mandrake, we had an open slate and Tom took over for several issues. Um, and uh, Bill later, Bill's one of those guys who kind of fell through the cracks, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of stories like that. Yeah, he uh, he's been dead some time now, but 
when he did die, it was years before anyone knew it because he'd been, you know, he'd literally, he was living in a boarding house and, uh, and when they, they more or less had to excavate him from his room because it was just hoarded up. He was living in one room in the house. It was just, it was sad. Oh, and sad. yeah, yeah, we found, I, I, I would, you know, the, you know it, you know, this country just does not. Um, it's easy to disappear. Yeah, yeah well, it doesn't take care of people with mental health issues at all. Yeah, you know, that's you're very just true. you're just left if you know, tough, tough, you know, tough it out, folks. You know, yeah. and and he did not get the help he needed, and, and basically, he had he had a lot of he had a lot of talent and. You know, he had a lot of stuff to get. He did some stuff for Teen Titans and a few other things, but yeah. then he just <laughs> sad. The, yeah, sad. Uh, he could, you know, but uh, then Tom was on it for a couple of for a few issues, and then we uh, finally landed our uh, uh, Scott Eaton. Yeah, right. And and we had Kim Demolder as the inker through the entire run, which helped give a lot of continuity to the. Yeah. To everything. So, um, yeah. so and, I was very lucky. I'm still, I'm still in regular contact with Kim. Oh, and Kim uh, kept going after you left the book. I think she stayed on he. for most of it. Uh, he Kim's a he. Pop. <laughs> uh, apologies, I was. <laughs> He's used to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. 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 Well, we would do. We would do interviews. Uh, at the time, and so 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 it's up. Uh, you've got a uh, a lot of female creators working on this mm -hmm. book. It's you, Tatiana Wood, and, and Kim. De uh, no, Kim. Kim. Yeah. Kim's a dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but it, um, yeah. but yeah, a, I I was that 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 was probably the last time last run that had an old school. Um, uh, production company, production, product, in-house production crew on it. Yeah, because I oh, think yeah. they went into to digital lettering not long after that. Yeah, and and uh, and then the the coloring. And I was I during my first year, I remember being taken down into the bowels of the DC offices and mm -hmm. being introduced to Tatiana and John uh, Constanza, who were my uh, uh, colorist and and letterer. Respectively, yeah. and uh, Tatjana was the widow of Wally Wood, oh, so okay. and so she always it's basically she was always guaranteed a job at DC for as long as she lived, mm -hmm. nice. and she she did and, and most of those colors that are on there are the original Tatjana Wood colors. In terms of the omnibus, yeah, they didn't they didn't recolor. They they, they had to recolor a few things yeah. because, like I said, they just you know. You know, yeah. let things go to pot in, in the in terms of the, the original artworks and separations. So, uh, I think they don't. Uh, I think it was only compared to some of them where they had to completely recolor it, everything. I think I think it's only like maybe twenty percent was recolored or had to be re, re, re you know, recolored due to the the separations being you know screwed up. Yeah, but, um, it's interesting too because a lot of creators don't even get to meet other people working on no. same books anymore. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's even rarer. I mean, Craig is between me and I've only had two collaborators where I was tight with, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that well, you know, you know, uh, my current uh, creative partner, Craig Hamilton, and uh, Stan Shaw, who has who was. Uh, my artist on the Sunglasses After Dark series, and we actually, it was down to him and me to get that thing republished because uh, the art went all back to him after uh, Danzig had published it, and and we couldn't afford to buy the color sets from, from Danzig. Um, and mm -hmm. even if we did, we didn't like them. We never liked the color work on it. Um, yeah. And so we, when we had a chance of getting it redone at IDW, Stan went and taught himself digital coloring. Oh wow! And which wow. is one of the reasons why it took like years to get the book done <laughs> because wow. it's two hundred pages, and 
And yeah, he was doing that problem. in between his, he was doing regular work for, for Microsoft at the time and teaching school, teaching our class. And so <laughs> it's going to take forever. So yeah, um, yeah, it took a while. <laughs> it took a while. What was the inspiration for like the first monster we really see, like the alligator monster? Le yeah. Le Padu. Uh, Le Padu was in, was inspired by the original short story by Ted Sturgeon that was probably the inspiration for Swamp Thing, mm -hmm. which yeah. was called It. Yeah. Uh, where uh, a man is walking across a, a river or wading across a river and he's murdered and his mm -hmm. body sinks to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And over the course of time, other things attached to his skeleton. And somehow one day it reanimates and he goes looking for the person who killed him. And, and I read that when I was like maybe eight <laughs> yeah, I, 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 my parents didn't care what I read as long as I was reading. But and so I was reading, you know, a lot of really weird stuff. I mean, one of my favorite anthology. Yeah, that was from an anthology called Monsters that was edited by uh, uh, Basil Davenport, if I remember correctly. Oh. Yeah, the fact that I could still remember, I, I remember it was, very nice. I had the book and everything, and, and the other one, what, the other anthology that I really liked. Uh, was uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock's Monster Museum. Gotcha. Which oh, had... Uh, uh, oh, great. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Ray Bradbury's Homecoming in it, which was more or less the inspiration for the Adams Family. Very nice. And, yeah, I have that on the shelf over here, actually. Oh, nice. Uh, there's also a couple of uh, 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 public domain collections that from the 60s that uh, uh, Whitman put out one was the tales to shutter by and more tales to shutter by and they were all kind of like victorian edwardian short you know short stories horror stories ghost stories and mm -hmm. and but i gobbled those up too and um oh. i can't imagine kids nowadays reading victorian stuff like well like that. yeah i mean not unless it's on youtube somehow yeah, uh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> i mean I, I, the, the assumption yeah, literacy the the literacy level of yeah. yeah. But then again, I wasn't you know I was it wasn't like all my other buddies were reading them either at that age. It was it was me. Sure, <laughs> so you, know, were, you were pretty me and my cousin. Yeah. We were the, you know, we were the only people reading those things. So we swapped books back and forth quite a bit. Hmm. And um, but but that's what Le, who Le Badu is uh, influenced by is uh, Ted Sturgeon's it. And I met Ted. Years oh. uh, shortly right. before he, before his death, mm -hmm. well, and he's a very nice man. Nice. Did, most people most people don't realize he's the guy who invented most of the stuff about Vulcans on Star Trek. Oh, interesting. He wrote yeah, yeah he wrote the cool. screenplay uh, screenplay for a mock time where Swamp uh, or as my mom always described where, where Spock has to swim upstream to mate <laughs> 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 like a salmon. <laughs> You um, you mentioned family, and that is the is it's a it's a horror. It, I mean, it, it, well, I'll, I'll throw one more thing. It, it, right now, there's a lot of praise being given to this uh, this book, The Immortal Hulk, because it's doing horror in a in a superhero book, and there's a lot of kind of of uh, these these distorted creature. But what strikes me is a lot of, and I have no idea if, if uh, Al Ewing's you know was inspired by your run, but a lot of what you've done here many decades ago is very similar to this examination of a family and person and and kind of what, what's the monster, what's the human. Um, it feels like that's a run that's going on right now today that bears a lot of uh, inspiration from what you did. And well, I'm, I'm not familiar with it, I'm, but basically the, the family is the oldest story. Yeah. And, <laughs> that's, oh. And I'm, that's, I'm, I'm curious, you, you, uh, there was some, there was some controversy. When you did this book, there were some people who didn't, uh, who struggled with a relationship and kind of what was going on with Abigail and, and, and everything else did, did, was there, how did that, there was no internet, there was no Twitter where people get, could get mad. Oh, I got hate mail. I got hate mail. How, how, <laughs> what, what, were, what was the big anger in that? Well, I think it's because, um, the, 
the idea that there's a lot of people with mama issues out there. <laughs> um, especially some guys reading comic books. Um, Fair enough. And may not have a whole lot of experience with women. Yeah. Or how women think or how families work or how marriage works. But I think a lot of it, and mainly I would come by it as people, some people read comics well, most people, for escapism. Sure. And well, I got, I did get a, one letter from a guy basically said, I'm going through a divorce. I just can't take this. And it was just like, yeah, I was going through a divorce when I was writing it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so there. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's like um, certain times in your life, you maybe you don't want to read certain types of content based on. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but basically, um, um, I had the I had a choice because because it wasn't me who broke them up. Right, is that a? It wasn't me who ended that marriage. It was it was um, DC because DC made the decision that they didn't want Swamp Thing lumbered with a wife and child by the end of the run, my second year. And a nice comic trend, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, you know they, they seem to they seem to still be laboring under the misconception that younger people were reading comics when and yep. in truth it's been just the baby boomers and how, the gen x people how amazing though in in the early 90s the uh the idea of like well we need to reshape this comic for younger people let's not have the marriage uh, theme that would present itself i mean it, 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 they're doing it today this this yeah. is all this idea and it's like <laughs> i don't know how much how long do we have to repeat this cycle it's, Crazy. Well, they what they uh, also with the uh, uh, the delusion that that romance ends after marriage. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and you know, but so, yeah. but basically they said you know we okay you we want him single so you can either so you you know feel free to kill him you can kill him if you want you know that's <laughs> actually the you can kill him if you want and the thing a Abby had already been murdered. Right. Yeah. We'd been down wasn't about, Yeah, she'd already been murdered before. And Alan had handled that. And I'm not going and I said, I'm not going back over his his ground at all. Um and and secondly, I'm not killing a two year old child. <laughs> um I don't know why it's funny. It just Yeah. Yeah, I'm not killing a toddler. Um, especially when I had put a lot of time and effort into making a, a fairly believable child. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I was not going to do that. And I don't I don't know if I was a man if that would have been that might it, whether it's me being a woman made that no, I'm not doing that. No. <laughs> and and um so I decided to destroy the marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, take his wife and child away from him that way. And and apparently a lot of people Death in comics is meaningless. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. However, divorce seems to be permanent. That's that's true. Yeah. And the yeah. reason for this, as far as I can tell, is none of us none of us knows what happens when we drop dead. Right. None of us know. But there's a good chance that a good chunk of us have been inside a divorce court. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, we know there's no coming back from that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think that it, it, that's what the, that's the thing is. It's like no, no. I, that's what that that's what made it. And no one attempted to get them back together within that continuity. After yeah. that, no effort. They just had to re burn it all down and build again. Apparently, but. Um, so my attitude was like, okay, well, I'm leaving and this is what you want me to do. So you want me, you know, it's so, okay. So I just did the, you know, writer's equivalent of doing a Pete Townsend windmill and just bang. Okay. Follow that. <laughs> well, <laughs> funny thing is it, it, um, it, it all flowed so well. I mean, you, you'd created the family structure. You'd you, you were working from the beginning about this dynamic within Swamp Thing of, of the human side and the parliament of the tree side and this conflict within. I mean, you, you, all the seeds were there, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. So when you got to that moment, 
um, it, it just, you've done the work with, with the child, you've done work with, uh, with the governor, with Lady Jane. And I mean, all these pieces were set up that it, it felt very. Oh, and, and he screwed it up himself. Right. Yeah. Didn't, right. didn't need a super villain. He screwed it up himself. Which made it a powerful <laughs> story of just, yeah. and, and it, you also got, I mean, as a reader, I remember reading it the first time I had the same feelings going through it again, that there's a sense of inevitability where you, you see, he, you, you see the trap that he's setting for himself. You see the, the road he's going down. He, he seems helpless not to go down it. It, it just, all these pieces, uh, it just, it, it flowed very well. So I remember this is a very powerful moment. In the well, what, what gets me is how many people have misremembered that art too. Cause, oh yeah, he left, Abby left him cause he was screwing the, the nanny. No. Yeah, that was after. The, and the, Annie, the, na yeah. the nanny came after she left. Yes. No, he yeah. betrayed her with himself. Yes, it was yeah. it was him splitting, uh, trying to. Well, I mean, trying to have ways, his cake and eat it too. Yeah, it was like the. Uh, I mean, no offense, but what I'm about to say, it reminded that part of of trying to create a duplicate of yourself is like a you know '80s kind of comedy movie where the guy's trying to get away with something, so he's got a dummy stand in. Yeah, for, well, it's know, like Doctor Manhattan. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's what in his his relationship with Silk Spectre was when she realized that there were like fifty yeah. of him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and he wasn't really there most of the time. Yeah, and, and it's like screw you then. <laughs> but then it was a powerful moment because it was the betrayal of the family uh, that yeah. you had spent all the time putting the work into of this family unit. Now he's betraying it by saying, "I'm going to leave you with this knockoff kind of." And the knockoff resented it. Right. The right. knock. The knockoff said, "If you're not going to be here, I'll take them. If you yeah. don't want them, I'll take them." Because yeah. it was basically, the, uh, the, it wasn't just even a knockoff. It was that part, as as Lady Jane points out, that was the part of you that actually loves them. Yeah. And cares about them and will protect them. You left that here. Right. You know, when you went gallivanting off and then you more or less killed it in front of her. Yeah, you stuck it back <laughs> into yourself, which was the death of, I mean, it felt like the death of the part of him that loved her was he was reabsorbing to make less meaningful. I it just, it was yeah. a, it's a really powerful moment in comics. It led to her leaving. It led to, um, I just, I just all these, all these pieces. It, it, it yeah. flowed very normally. I do remember there being people angry about it though. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like, how dare I? Yeah. <laughs> oh, except Alan, Alan called me and said, Oh yeah. He, he praised me for making that decision. He goes, no woman or white bond would stay in that mood. <laughs> No, it, that no, it was, it was, but it is, it is funny because the alternative would have been killing her and the kid, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like so. Which, which would you rather have, the, them alive or dead? Yeah, alive and not with him, or dead and not with him. <laughs> so I, I may get the feeling like some of the comic fans would prefer the death just so he didn't have his shame of it. it it's in a weird. Uh, that's that. That's bad. Maybe a it was bad. an unheroic. You know, a hero, it, well, that was his hubris. Yeah. You know, that was his, you know, that was his Theseus moment, his Oedipus moment, you know, where you, your pride is your downfall. Yeah. And he thought he could do, you know, both of these things and not get caught or, or have, like I said, have his cake and eat it too. And, and, and it's more like being his life a swamp thing. The champion of the green is who, what he was cheating on her with. Right. Yeah. Right. And and especially um, and it's it's um yeah you know, it's aged well that storyline has aged well I think and I think people understand a lot a lot of people at the time just thought oh Lady, Lady Jane's evil no she, she broke up his marriage no she didn't. I do remember that. And you're right that people have misremembered. Uh, but you also did this. I also I mean, thought the dancing daisies are evil for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> Simply because they evolved. <laughs> I uh, you you spin an entire issue on the backstory of Lady Jane um, as well. That was that was that wound up. I mean, giving a lot of depth to that character. So well, it, that, was, it, that was based on a on a family member of mine. Oh wow! It's part of it was. Um, wow. um, and also, it was also a way of like incorporating uh, the work of George Sands and you know and Henry Miller and you know pointing out just the inequities of being a, women were considered in, in in England were considered infants until they married. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, you, your husband, you could not inherit. Your husband had to inherit everything, and you know he, he had complete control over your money and your life, and, and until he died. And then once you got once once you became a widow, then you could have control over things. But um, uh, it, uh, it it wound up being a very powerful. Um, it interruption's the wrong word because it's not. You were you were just telling your story. It's but an it's interlude. Not. It's an it's interlude. interlude. That's a yeah, that's origin a, story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but and but the story of, 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 of with Lady Jane, mm -hmm. where Lady Jane runs back, runs goes, you know, she's off at work, and yeah. comes home and finds her house on fire with her children inside, and runs inside to save them. That actually happened to a cousin of mine. Wow. Back in, you know, I never knew her. The, you know, she, my grandmother was a child when she died. So, but she was working at a textile mill in Kentucky, and uh, and they came home and the house was on fire. And uh, she ran in and she survived actually. But uh, she grabbed the doorknob, and the doorknob branded her palm. Oh. And she until the day she died, she had the you know. The imprint of that doorknob, you know, right. on her on her palm, and she always wore black black velvet gloves to to hide it because she was. But she met, yeah, one of her children died, but she managed to get the other one out. And um, but I grew up hearing that story. Yeah. And and so Lady Jane is is kind of folded into that, and uh, also uh, one of my ancestors, well, not even an ancestor, like a distant relative. Um, was Lady Jane Grey, who was Queen of England for nine days, <laughs> and um, you know, that's on my daddy, granddaddy's side of the family, my grand, uh, my total grandfather's side of the family. They were minor nobility, and and they got on the wrong side of Mary Queen of Scots for that, and that's why my my family's in America. <laughs> This is like, wow. well, look at that. They cut, they cut cousin Jane's head off. Well, let's go, let's go yeah. check on our properties in the new world. <laughs> so, time to take that cruise. Yeah. Yeah. Time Dude. to take that cruise over there. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but and so, so Lady Jane's named after her too. And uh, oh, very cool. Nice. Did you, was it your decision or editorial getting to sort of wrap up the Liz Tremaine uh, story where? That was my idea. Okay. Yeah, because she was, she wasn't really being used and utilized in any way. Yeah. And um, I figured turning her up, you know, turning her, turning her lesbian, it seemed like a natural trope. It, it, well, I should say a natural occurrence, you know, thing for the, character the development yeah. of the character because i had um uh when i was living in new orleans i had a friend a couple of friends who had been um uh, abducted off the street and gang raped mm -hmm. and one of them after that couldn't deal with men anymore and uh so that thing that all the stuff that she went through with dennis Right. It seemed to me yeah. like that might that you know that that kind of trauma would probably uh, have an impact. Leave, yeah. Have an impact, and so I figured you know Chester's a nice, sweet guy, but he, he was good, you know. But she needed to grow and find herself and be more comfortable. And I actually had a, I actually had a story uh, for tr for Liz that we never used, where uh, she's out in the Pacific Northwest. And protesting logging with her uh, with her girlfriend and uh, some other um, uh, Greenpeace kind of people, and they're chained in front of a like the largest redwood uh, in this forest, and they realize that they're going to get you know because they're out in the middle of nowhere, and no one's going to know what happens to them. And they realize they're seriously in danger of being killed. And she has that seed that Swamp Thing gave her. Says, "If you ever need me," yep. And she yeah. swallows it. And guess who grows out of that redwood? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, but we never we never got around to doing that. So yeah, that'd be a great story to do in some sort of Swamp Thing annual or something if they end up yeah. uh, wanting to do that. If anyone's listening, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And wants to reach out to Nancy. 
Uh, you probably yeah. have a better chance of getting you than Alan Moore at this point. So yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah for at least for the time being. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I still I still have a great deal of fondness for Swampy. Yeah. And, um, who, in the page. Who, who, in case if you want to know who I think he sounds like when he yeah. talks, it's Lance yeah. Hendrickson. Oh, Lance Hendrickson. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Although I have met Ray Wise. I mean, he, he was, he was, oh, you were at Swamp Thing? Yeah, I, said, oh, I played him once. Well, well, not him. I played the guy he, what he, used, he was going to be. He used to be. So I said, yeah. yeah, I remember. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's so, awesome. Um, you know, it, was it your decision or, or again, editorial that uh, you sort of brought the uh, Sunderland, uh, you know, back with, you know, brought in Constance and that was, that. that was my idea. Constance is completely my creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they said, you know, do whatever you want to do. And I said, well, I'll play with some of the elements of the, you know, the known Swamp Thing universe. And one of the things was General Sunderland. Mm -hmm. And um, I created uh, Constance, Connie, mm -hmm. um, uh, which was an inside joke between me and the people, and because uh, I've been a member of the Church of Sub Genius for oh, nice, okay, thirty nice. something, forty something years, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, and J.R. Bob Dobbs' wife, who was the power behind the throne, is Connie Dobbs, and so I, oh. I just you know, like <laughs> Connie good. Sunderland, and uh, I made her the uh, you know a, a extremely formidable opponent. And apparently, yeah. she's the only character from that run that's appeared anywhere else in the DC universe, in the Vertigo universe. And not right. even that much, I don't, I don't think. Like she appeared a little bit, and then um, th there was this like Unmen series. I think she appeared. Yeah, in. she was an uh, American freak. Yeah. And, and then, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that, she's she's basically Lex Luthor, you know. Yeah. In, 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 in many her. ways, she's you know she's a perfect character in that regard. So she's just yeah. And and um, but apparently uh, when they had the uh, Swamp Thing streaming series uh, that was on mm -hmm. DC Universe and is now no, they right. re aired on CW. And, yeah. Um, the um, the character of uh, Mrs. Sunderland apparently mm -hmm. um, kind of folded in both her and the. Connie and Mrs. Sun uh, Bubble Sunderland. Because yeah. I got a I got a uh, royalty check for the use of Bubble Sunderland in the Swamp Thing series. Yeah, that's good, at least. <laughs> so, that's a, I was like, really that's a good outcome. Yeah. Okay. But they just kind of like folded her and Connie together yeah. in some ways. Um, and um, um but the guy who uh, who was the showrunner on the series, Mark Verheiden. Mm -hmm. I've known Mark for 40 years. I oh, mean, wow. yeah, so like when he got to be the executive producer, I said, you better use some of my characters. <laughs> 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 and, and he did, he did use elements from my run. Liz Tremaine's an out lesbian, although now she's a, what, she's a deputy or something? Or, yeah, they, they gave her yeah. some other problems. And, and, uh, and, uh, the some of the uh, you know and plus Central Lynn's wife having a wife and and all that and then yeah. but yeah I figured you know the the best thing to do would be combine Sunderland and Arcane together yeah. kind of especially um, kind of give it a, a twist on that old you know like as a family it's all family it's all family you know Uncle Anton and and and. Well, it, it it upped the 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 horror of Anton as well. You found new ground to cover with him to make him more threatening and and uh, it, you know it it just it, you you did a lot with that character. I think that that actually but he's a he's a possessing spirit and yeah. all that. He's not yeah he's one of those who escaped. You know that was one of the other a couple of uh, uh, tie, vaguely tied into the Sandman series where Sandman, you know, where, where Lucifer goes, eh, crap, you know, fuck it, I'm going to go, oh, excuse me. <laughs> my, pardon my not, friends. Not a problem. <laughs> um, um, decides to throw open the gates of hell and, you know, Arcane's one of those spirits who, you know, escaped, one of the damn souls. So, because <clears throat> yeah. of course he is, because he's not, you know, he's a formidable Super villain in, in our world, but in hell, he's just yeah, 
Yeah, he's just yeah. he's just, you know, he's he might as well just have you know a trainee. Yeah, <laughs> Hi, my name's Trainee. <laughs> no, I love that. Did did they did editorial like help? Did, so this this it was this kind of loose tie into Sandman. Did did somebody say, hey, here's a way that these stories could kind of link together, or did you? Work uh, no, uh, no. I, I I commented on it. I said I'd like to use uh, Arcane, and they said, well, well. He's dead, but and in hell. But I think Neil's got this thing where where they're coming out of hell soon. So where where a lot of people are escaping from hell. So I I utilize that. Oh, perfect. Okay. Still and uh, and, uh, and the uh, characters of Agony and Ecstasy, I think, are from Hellblazer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it still seems like more coordination than we get today in a lot of cases. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all very. It was all very you know spur of the moment, and mm -hmm. and a lot of it just like. You know, do what do what do what you do, and do what you can't. I, they more or less left me alone. There, you know, there were a yeah. couple of things I wasn't allowed to do. There's a, the one that sticks in my mind, uh, was when Swamp Thing with the Mardi Gras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a scene where he's just wandering through, wandering through the French Quarter, and no one notices him because it's Mardi Gras, and they just assume it's a really nice Swamp Thing costume. Yeah. <laughs> and and, yeah. and he yeah. walks past a couple, making out. And in the original in the original script, it's two guys dressed as Batman and Robin. Oh, nice! Yeah. And you can literally yeah. hear like like in the old Tex Avery cartoons where the guy went nuts and it sounded like someone literally yeah. flipping a like a sugar bowl lid, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the little flags come out of his ears. Yeah, um, that happened at DC editorial. I can <laughs> and picture that. Then I said, well, okay, well, how about if I change it so it's Batman and the Joker? <laughs> and they go, oh, <laughs> and I said, well, how about if I, okay, what if one of them's a woman? And they go, okay. <laughs> and I said, but we can't have Batman. And I said, okay, how about if it's Catman and the Joker? Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I'm sorry. Yeah, so yeah. It ended up, the Joker ended up being a woman in that. So, yeah, but yeah, the, 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 there's nowadays that probably wouldn't have been an issue. But yeah, um, but yeah so I, that was. <laughs> that, that was the only time I really got a, any real static from him. And. Yeah. So maybe the secret here is if you're if you're a good writer and editorial just lets you do what you want to do, good things happen. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, <laughs> if you're a good writer, I mean that, yeah. that that there are some people out there that are just. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get to just put like a, you use Constantine a little bit? Was that all? Did that have to get coordinated and okayed, or you were able to kind Not of just really. do it? Okay. Not really, because he came out of Swamp Thing. Yeah. And, you know, so him popping up, it wasn't really an issue. Um, my attitude was like, I, I wanted to write Swamp Thing the way I, I wanted to write Constantine the way I wanted. I preferred seeing him, which is, I didn't, I'm one of those people, I've never needed to know that much about John Constantine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't need to know about his family, how he grew up, you know, any of that. You know, uh, just the little things here, and the little little hints in there, like he'd been in a rock punk band and that he did this and he did that. And he was probably, you know, you know, possibly bisexual. Who knows? I didn't need any of that. I didn't yeah. need the whole nine yards because to me he was a lot more interesting as kind of like a punk version of the Phantom Stranger. Yeah. Where I, he's I, just like... Yeah. yeah. And so that's how I kind of wrote him. He was like a more wisecracking, um, you know, version of, you know, you, you just pops up when you least need him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just want him, but most need him. That's the best way to do costumes, yeah. <laughs> and, and also connecting the fact that, you know, the fact that, yeah, he always he was always going to be a part of Swamp Thing's continuity because he's Tefe's biological father. Right, yeah. And that was also part of the the mini series I was uh, that they ended up buying from me. That you know the proposal was um, the Phantom Strain. You know when Phantoms uh, th there's one thing that kind of gets 
a little glossed over in when the Phantom Stranger does finally pop up in the Swamp Thing. Yep. Um, when Arcane is 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 loose, as he's introduced to the baby, and and he's realizing that the baby is a result of a Constantine and an Arcane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, you shouldn't. This won't end well. Crossing the streams, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh. And it's an elemental. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. that was a good. I, I mean, the, the whole handling of, of Tefe and, and the character. I mean, you you manage to you have a, a an infant. The infant is not just portrayed as uh, innocent and perfect and but not evil. I mean, you have this this. I, very, I like to think I was. She was. I was writing Baby Yoda before Baby Yoda. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. In that regard, because I had a bunch of nieces and nephews at the time. They're all roughly that age. Mm-hmm. You know, two-year-olds, are they're absolutely adorable, but you have to keep an eye on them. For sure. You know, yeah. they'll accidentally wash a cat to death. Yeah. Because yeah. the cat's dirty. Yeah. They yeah. don't see it. It's, it's not good and evil. It's just like they, they think very linearly. Right, yeah. And they don't understand subtext or, you know, you know everything is as they see it. And... Or as best as they understand it, yeah. And they don't, they don't, you know, their minds are still developing, and their understanding of the world is still developing, and everything is still basically centered around themselves. To the point where, if something bad happens, and you know, the kid will automatically assume it's their fault. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, and, it's- it, it it was just done really really well. It and it, it because it was all these pieces. Uh, she's young. She has more power, and she knows what to do with. There's the Constantine Arcane connection. There's all these different elements. And plus, she's got demon blood in her too. Yeah, you know, you know, right. which kind of got forgotten along the line. But um, so and it and it was kind of like revealed, uh, but no one ever really do, did anything with it. That Abby's mother was a witch. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, a lot of things that were in play here that didn't didn't get used, which is a shame. I mean, even the handling of Tepe in the the, the second annual, the Children's Crusade tie-in, you mm-hmm. wound up doing a lot of work about the. I mean, I think that's one of the first times you get a sense of this, some of the dynamic of this character getting older and and what she has going into her. But yeah, unfortunately, I tried to give her as a good a childhood as I possibly could, <laughs> and apparently. She, before they got rid of her, they she uh, went through a lot of unpleasant stuff that I wouldn't have done. But yeah, yeah. Um, the aging up was a, a very strange choice, I think, in general. But yeah, so she's you know she had a lot of stuff done to her later that I wouldn't have done. She, they, they grew up, you know, grew her, you know, well, she can't do anything with a kid. They have to be a teenager. Make them, make them. Yeah, you know, that's that's what happens yeah. in soap operas. You know, someone will have a baby. Yeah, they'll they'll be pregnant for like three years on the soap opera. They'll have yeah. a baby, and then like two months later, he's going to high school because yeah, it's something <laughs> it's something hack writers do, you know, yeah. age up a, a beloved kid uh, to make it easier for them to write because they don't know how to write well. Yeah, yeah. they don't know yeah. how to write children. Yeah, and and time that that's my attitude. You know, most people. In comics with children, they basically just stick the kid in the crotch of a tree and they just walk off. <laughs> you know, just like here, stay put. You know, like like yeah. baby Yoda's like here, stay put. No, I'm not. You know, I'm gonna go <laughs> eat someone's children because yeah. <laughs> they look good. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, Imagine if Disney came in and was like, "We need to age up Baby Yoda because we don't know what to do with this child." Yeah. So, it's so ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's a seventy-five-year-old infant, isn't he? Yeah, Something I mean, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah, yeah, like they're like kangaroos. I, I guess they're kind of like kangaroos when they're born. They're like still embryos, and yeah. You know, by the time you, you, by the time they're fit to be seen, they're still infant. But you know, they haven't like, you know, meh. <laughs> <laughs> like an arsenal or something, you know, um, but but yeah, uh, I tried to make her a believable child, mm-hmm. which means that she would have temper tantrums, and sometimes that you know it might turn ugly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and but also I made the point of her, the way she sees the world was when she started creating things 
they were like how kids draw because mm-hmm. everything has a face on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The tree has a face on it. You know, the, you know, you know, I'm, you know kill me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, um, oh, existence is pain. Uh, yeah. oh, the, the dance and the dancing daisies, which she kind of created yeah. as little playmates, and then kind of forgot about, and they can sit, continue to evolve. Yeah, <laughs> because they're actually living things. It was and, a sunspot, spot, you might say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was all inspired by um, uh, the guy, that little uh, little character Gizmo. Yep. That's in the oh, yeah, corner yeah. of the old Gyro Gearloose comics. Mm-hmm. I love that character. He was, like, he was always imitating what the what Gyro is doing. And, uh, <laughs> I'd always like uh, follow him around. I, was, I thought he was thought he was pretty good, and and so that was my tribute to to uh, to Carl ba- Carl Barks was the, the the Dancing Daisies, and they you know they considered to continue to have a civilization, yeah, and. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and language that was com- completely composed of the word "la." Yeah, <laughs> it just, it, it, just, depending on how he said it. <laughs> it. There's just so much heart here, like, and and so much emotion. Like every every death, every horrible thing, like you, you it really hit. I mean, even when you know Tefe accidentally kills the cat, and like well, she didn't these, kill it. Well, it didn't kill she it. She just but, turned yeah. it inside out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that yeah. It was a horrific and Abby's moment. response. Oh my God, it's still alive! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so Swampy has to kill it. He's like, yeah. I'll take care of it. Here. It yeah. is to get inside by himself so he can compose. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but that just all of it hits, and, and it all like just it it it's so powerful in a way. I I think a lot of comics like aren't able to hit like before or since with the yeah. amount of characters and the amount of heart and that went into all of this for a horror book yeah. as well. Well, it's, so, just, it's, it's just depends on the individual writer and yeah. at the time. And, and, uh, and I was, I think I was given a lot of leeway because I was a novelist and there's a lot of insecurity in comics about if you come in from outside, you know, if I was a fangirl who'd come up, they would have just, I'd have gotten all kinds of bullshit. But yeah. the fact that I was a novelist who'd gotten awards and everything and I came in and they were like, ooh. And and you yeah. see it when, when movie people come in. And do That's it. how it is now, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think I was given a lot, you know, given a lot more leeway because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm a real writer. It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but, 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 yeah, even how you handle chess. And I never bits. said that. That's what they would say. Well, you're a real writer. It's like, you know, Alan's a real writer. You know, Neil's a real writer. Yeah. It's like, you know, but, you know, this, 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 the more things change, the more they change. Yeah, the more things change, the more they say the same. Yeah. But with like Chester, I, I love how you did Chester because it also feels like a, a lesser writer or more edgy writer would have been like, oh, Chester's going to like snap and murder people. Like that seemed like the direction a, oh, a, sure. a, a more edgy writer or, or something like that might have taken like, oh, he's losing everything and we're seeing him deteriorate. But instead you handle him with like love and nuance in in a, in a way that makes him a more relatable character well yeah. he, he all his things he was being left he was he was a character that you know the stereotypical hippie harold head yeah. and he was being kept in this bubble where he was always going to be the hippie guy and he and i had him so no you have to be in a you know this okay everyone's leaving and evolving and changing i got to do that too because yeah, I'm yeah. getting left behind. All my friends are doing things, and plus, uh, and, and a very, a very important thing for him was the murder of the professor. Yeah, right. And he realized, I've got to take this guy's place. Yeah, yeah. And I and I have the capacity. I can do that. And if this guy was willing to die for what he believed in, I'm well. It's time for me to step up. Yeah. And and complete my education and take take my place. You know, it's a lot of good layer. I mean, the uh, the main characters have a sense of direction. The the sub characters have a sense of direction. Yeah, everybody seems like they're in this comic for a point. <laughs> you don't have just cardboard cutout characters hanging around. 
No, uh, I, cr I created a few that were just, you know, basically just kind of like reflections of people I knew, like JoJo. Yeah. Uh, I had a, I knew a few people in New Orleans like JoJo. And yeah. Alex Rawls, uh, Sheriff Rawls, was named after a friend of mine. Um, uh, uh, Alex Rawls, who's a poet uh, in, in New Orleans, but uh, he was also named after Lou Rawls. And, um, and, uh, yeah, you know, so I, I, you know, I, I created what I could, you know, with mm -hmm. Bonnie and 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 some of the other uh, continue, you know, supporting characters, mm -hmm. and just give it, you know, give it, you know, give it some life, and um, yeah, and not and not be completely eaten alive by continuity. Yeah, and, well, yeah, and I was I, I was more interested in telling a, a good story than fan service. I guess maybe that's, that's yeah. It, oh, yeah, it, 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 it feels like it. Maybe it's just how it. <laughs> oh, that's nice. It, it maybe it's just how it aged, but it 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 feels like you have a better respect of the continuity and and I mean again, you you didn't kill the you didn't take the easy route of just killing the character no. off. No, um, that to me seems more fan friendly than. I'm well. I'm done with them. We'll just you know we'll kill them off, and then some other writer can come along. Well, and killing off killing off your character pointlessly killing off characters was only starting to take off right then. Yeah, <laughs> the the start of a great trend. Yeah, uh, yeah, fridging. Yeah. The fridging, yes. Yeah, uh, but it, but it was just it was so pointless because then the character would get resurrected at some later date, and it's like to me that none of that is fan service. That's just moving the the deck chairs around in a mm -hmm. lot of yeah. Uh, your your run, you can pick it up. You can get the om omnibus, and it it holds up as a really excellent story with a lot of great character work and stuff that matters. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, I, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, it, I, I had pretty much given up on DC ever releasing it. To tell you the truth, you know, and whether they'll ever reprint it in trade paper form or, or split it up in trade paper form, I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, to, I think it's out of print. Yeah. I think they sold out of the, uh, the print run. I, I think I, you're right. Um, it's yeah. not like we've got a show to promote and possibly cross merchandise with. So why would they? <laughs> yeah. Why would they? You know. Well, 2020 put through so much. That's true. You know, unexpected roadblocks in front of there because I was going to go on a book tour for the thing and. Yeah. You know, you know it's. You know, a few conventions and I managed to get one in before the, you know, everything stopped. Yeah. You know, yeah. Stopped. And, uh, and then, but since then DC's more or less collapsed yeah. and everyone, all my editors that I worked with all now, none of us are gone. Yeah. Yeah. They're all gone. You know. So I, I don't know. Yeah. They, they have broken some omnibuses up into like a couple of fat trades. Uh, mm -hmm. They did that with the uh, Bronze Age uh, Swamp Thing omnibus. They broke up into like three trades. So it, it could happen. They, yeah, they so have done that before. If I figure something, so now that it's suddenly dawned on them that they've got an entire, you know, two year run written by a woman, they need to kind of like do something with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. Go make your money. Um, yeah. all, that's what we're told. Yeah, my, yeah. My, my fat one percent. Yeah. <laughs> they got to do that. They got to bring you back to do like an annual, and then they got to reissue the omnibus with another story by you to get everyone to double dip and buy it again. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> that's the plan. That's how you make your money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I should I should mention what I'm doing right now yes, before please, please. I before I sign off. Yeah. Is uh, right now I'm working with uh, Craig Hamilton, who has um, uh, worked on Aquaman for DC back in the yeah. '80s, and uh, was um, an anchor and illustrator on Fables at Vertigo for yep. years and years and years. Yeah. Um, as well as then did stuff for Spectre and Starman. Um, uh, he and I uh, we live in the same town now. Uh, and he and I are going to be starting up a um, studio, and oh. we're work currently working on um, an original creator-owned uh, thing called The Adventures of Captain Finn, which is about a lesbian mermaid pirate captain and her uh, raucous crew of, of mythological characters on the high seas. 
finding, you know, trying to find a homeland on the high seas of the 17th, 17th century, 18th century. And um, um, it's, um, we're, we're just now really getting started on it. And I have, uh, like I said, I have the omnibus. I've got this, the, uh, the Sonia Blue uh, yeah. books. I've got some stuff brewing in Hollywood that hopefully I'll be able to talk about a little later this year. And, um, and like I said, I also did, you know, if, if, if anyone wants to look at us, find my stuff, I'm, you can look, find me on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, and, uh, and comiXology. Yeah. Um, but right now, uh, Craig and I are in the, in the, uh, in the early stages of uh, trying to get all this together. The idea is that it will be both a graphic novel and a prose novel series. Oh, excellent. So, um, I'm in the process of doing that, and the and I've just turned in a short story for Joe Landstill's Drive-In Anthology, oh, uh, great. commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Drive-In. Oh, very cool. Uh, the creation of the Drive-In universe, and uh, of course, I'm doing stuff with y'all. Yeah. Thank you very much, Deb. Yeah, that. <laughs> no, I, I, um, well, definitely, yeah. I mean, check out the omnibus. Um, yeah, go see, go to the blue novels. The uh, we'll, we'll have the links up here for people to see. And I hope uh, when you do uh, get this kicked off with Craig, that uh, you'll yeah. come back and we can chat about that a little bit. That'd be great. Yeah, if you could, yeah. you could if you could link up his uh, his GoFundMe because we're starting to get those bills now. Yeah, <laughs> and even yeah, they're yeah. Yeah, ha, get, ha, breaking your leg at, in your late fifties in America without health insurance is not something I recommend. Yeah. Well, yeah, and <laughs> that, that continues to be one of the problems in the comic industry is you know, how some of this stuff is treated. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, we're all wishing them the best. Yeah. Well, that's a weird thing. The first two years I was on Swamp Thing, I had uh, health insurance. Yeah, okay. no, it, it was not. It, it, it was not as bad as it is today, and I don't think people realize that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was not always this way. I think people no. are say oh it's always been it's, it's, it's the libertarian hell hellscape that <laughs> since 19 that, that's been dropped down on us and uh, i'm hopefully hopefully that will eventually you know be revealed to be the yeah yeah that's got a pile of crap that it is <laughs> <laughs> it's it's yeah. got to change. There's, there's um, too many problems in the comic industry get deflected as uh, ah, they're trolls on the internet. But then they, you, you hear yeah. about this health insurance stuff. It's like no, there are actual problems that need to be solved. And, yeah. Um, yeah, and and then uh, a lot of your like uh, Vampirella stuff is available in trade still, right? Is that yeah, right? yeah, and, and on Comicsology, yeah, I did. I yeah. had a year and a half, thirteen issue run on Vampirella. It's been collected in two trade paperbacks and the omnibus. Okay. And um, I did a, a, a couple of annuals for them. I did a, a, a tie-in series, a um, couple of tie-in series. Um, uh, and also I did Army of Darkness, Furious Road, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, which I had a lot of fun working on. And, awesome. uh, and that's also from, from them. And I did some, a uh, couple of Red Sonja uh, miniseries for them. Great. So, Yes, I have. You know, so all that's all that's technically out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we we will see. We will see. Well, and, great, great. Go get that stuff if you're if you're listening now. Definitely go there and definitely go to this omnibus uh, and these these issues of Swamp Thing. I, there, it is an incredible run. And and Nancy, <laughs> I know you have to go, but I I wanted to thank you so much for spending all this time with us. Yes. Uh, no problem. No problem. And I'll 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 make sure to I'll I'll talk to Craig and see about uh, get that set up. He's when it comes to things like Skype and that, he's is like he's like a Victorian. I don't understand these machines. <laughs> it's like, it's like, well, this uh, unfortunately this year has uh, led to a lot of people to get more comfortable with uh, video conference and things, and they probably well, it's just like talking to my grandmother sometimes. With <laughs> Yeah, learn to yeah, learn. Yeah, the only thing my grandmother made a decision she wasn't going to deal with any um, technology invented after my grandfather died, oh. and the only thing with the two exceptions being the microwave and the Mister Coffee. Okay, <laughs> 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 I can't knock that. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, well, 
Nancy, thank you so much. And Joe, thank you as well for, for helping to do. <laughs> yeah, no problem. This, this was great. I, I loved uh, sitting and getting to chat with you both. And and yeah, hopefully uh, more people check out this one thing run, other stuff you've done, and uh, hopefully it'll all be uh, all be good and people will uh, get to experience, if they haven't already, uh, one of the best things you can in one thing. <laughs> for sure. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah, no problem. It. All right, y'all take care. Thank you. Right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.